So in the last part of uh, optical characterization basics, uh, we are going to look into uh, some more aspects, uh, some more uh, relations uh, that might be important uh, down the line. So uh, when we talk about uh, inelastic scattering in the last lecture, this was one of the lecture in the last slide and, and I missed out explaining few points there. So what we said there was that phonons when incident on a molecule can also excite uh, normal modes of vibration of that molecule or phonons in a solid. Mm, likewise, if the, uh, it, is, it can be scattered by phonons in the material. So if we have a photon incident on a material, it can be also scattered by the phonon and then it can gain the energy corresponding to those phonons. So that means there will be some kind of resonance that will come into the picture. And then there is something which is going to be the inelastic scattering. So in inelastic scattering, we know there are two types. One is the Raman scattering and one is the brilliant scattering. So in Raman scattering, uh, we have the optical phonons involved and in brilliant scattering, we have got the acoustic modes responsible for the scattering. So this is something which we have seen in the last lecture. But then uh, I think this is something which you have studied before, but I am not showing you anything in mathematical uh, nature. We are just uh, going to discuss the basic brief overview from a quantit uh, qualitative point of view. So when we basically talk about an optical mode of vibration and if you have got two different atoms in a system and they move against each other. So the keywords are different atoms and they move against each other. So you can see there are two different atoms and they are moving against each other. This is usually called the optical mode of vibration. Whereas in case of the acoustic mode of vibration, uh, we have this as moving in the same direction. So two different molecules will basically move in the same direction. Okay. So this is called, a, uh, this is basically for a linear diatomic chain. So this information is something which I missed in the last uh, lecture. Okay, so continuing with this, today I am going to talk a bit about the instrumentation part and this is a very general picture of the spectrophotometer. What we have usually is a source and then after that we place a monochromator. So you know that monochromator basically uh, helps us to uh, separate out the wavelength. So if we have a sample and we want a wavelength of a particular light, let us say UV radiation of a particular wavelength to be incident on it, we need to use certain kind of setup. So that monochromator might be a combination of grating, mirror and so on. So what we have is uh, a mirror which basically gets reflected and then we have got the grating and then we can say that uh, the wavelength gets separated out and then it is uh, traveling further. Then we have got something which is called a chopper. Now what happens is in a spectrophotometer, Mm, even without the sample, there are other uh, obstacles or the, there are other factors. For example, there is a mirror, there is a monochromator, all of these actually might create additional signals which is not coming from the sample. So what we do is we chop the uh, signal that means we divide it into two parts and one is sent to a reference. So suppose you have got a sample which you are keeping in a cuvet. A cuvette might be a quad uh, cube or might be a sample holder, uh, but then you need the signal from the sample and nothing from the sample holder. So a reference uh, might be something like a cuvette which is empty and uh, this will actually generate the signal and uh, the sample will also generate the signal which is inclusive of all the other factors including the cuvette and finally this is fed into the detector. Now what this does is this reference uh, uh, line that we have or the reference beam that we have which passes through a similar condition except the sample will generate something which we call as the baseline. Now this baseline has nothing to do with the sample so it needs to be subtracted from the original signal. So that is what is important and that is the reason that we are having a beam splitter kind of thing here. So if you consider a typical spectrometer it consists typically of couple of light sources. And then we have got a diffraction grating based monochromator. Well, the design might vary from system to system on how accurate or um, what kind of uh, uh, finance you have uh, so that you can actually give a better and high end setup. But in general, it is a couple of light sources, a diffraction grating based monochromator. Then we have got a sample chamber, of course, in which the sample is kept. And then we have got one or more detectors depending on what kind of signal you want to detect. So the instrument is basically equipped with two beams, uh, uh, one is uh, for the measurement of the reference and the other is to test the sample and both are done at the same time. Okay. So if we have something which we call as the baseline here, 
So, virtually all spectrophotometer can perform transmittance measurement. So, I think transmittance is a word which is very common. We know what is transmittance is all about. So, whenever uh, some kind of signal is incident on a sample, more some part of it is transmitted and some of it might be reflected, absorbed and so on. So, since it passes through the sample, the beam that we get is nothing but the transmitted beam. So, if we study the transmitted beam and compare it with the incident beam, we can actually have a lot of information. But mathematically speaking, it consists of measuring how much of a known incident light power shining on a sample passes through it. So, how much uh, intensity or how much power of the light that actually passes through the sample is something which is studied by the transmittance and this can be actually studied as a function of light wavelength. So, if you look into this relation, this is nothing but uh, Pt which is nothing but the power of the light that made through the sample. Okay? And this was actually power of the original incident light. So, both of them are power. So, there will be no unit. It is a unit plus quantity into 100. So, basically you get some kind of percentage here. So, if I say that uh, 80 percent is the transmittance, that means a high amount of light has crossed the sample. The sample is less opaque. Okay? The capturing capacity of the sample is less. So, so the T is uh, basically called the transmittance. So, uh, the detector basically respond uh, based on a number of factors, of course, uh, based on the signal from the sample. But apart from that, the detector response is a function of the factors like the wavelength. Okay? And then we have got the mirrors, the windows, the gratings and other optical component in the optical path of the spectrophotometer. And this other optical component, we can also contain the include the sample holder probably the cubit uh, in case of a UV visible uh, spectroscopy. And uh, then they that what happens is that will actually affect the photon energy or the power that is finally reaching the sample and reaching the detector at the end. Okay? So, these contribution needs to be negated and this is something which is called the baseline. So, these contributions to the spectrum not originating from the sample is called the baseline. So, this is uh, important uh, definition of baseline may be a uh, two marks question. What is the importance of transmittance? Okay, that again might be a question. Uh, so, you have to uh, understand what I have said and write down a proper answer when asked. Next again, uh, this is not the only uh, unwanted factor, the baseline. Uh, we also have something which we call as the dark current. So, it does happen sometimes that uh, even if there are no signals falling on the detector. The detector is not set to 0 and there is some value which is being displayed. So, that means there is a non-zero response of the detector under dark conditions. So, that means there is no signal falling on the detector and this is something which is called the dark current. So, if you want to measure the dark current for a particular detector, what is done is the light path is blocked by using an opaque sample. So, we do not allow any light to fall on the detector but still it shows some kind of signal and that is called the dark current. Both baseline and dark current uh, actually may vary with the usage of the instrument. What happens is with time the dark current or even the baseline might keep on increasing. So, that needs to be negated. So, it is usually advised that for every run uh, the baseline and the dark current are taken into consideration and the signal is subtracted from the uh, signal that is received from the sample. Then we have got the dual beam spectrometer as the term suggests there are basically two beams here and there are some very good advantages of this. Uh, it basically helps us to compensate for short term variation of the light sources intensity. So, by the time it reaches from the source to the sample there is lot of variation. So, this dual beam spectrometer will help to negate these effect and of course, the efficiency of the optical component common to both the beams. Now, the most variations in this time scale are due to light source intensity and detector efficiency changes due to temperature variation. So, temperature also plays a very important role sometimes uh, and, and it sometimes might affect uh, the signal that you receive. So, most of the times so these uh, factors also needs to be considered when doing the measurement. If you consider something as a reflectance, there are two types of reflectance. One is called the specular reflectance and the other one is called uh, the diffused uh, reflectance. So, let us try to understand the difference. So, specular reflectance is more or less like a mirror. It usually will follow the laws of reflection 
and what happens is the light that is reflected by the sample at an angle incident to that angle of the incidence is collected. So, you basically have a shape and then you have some light incident on it, the reflected light is basically collected and studied. But if you consider in general some practical examples, for example, let us say we have got some kind of powder sample or ceramic or paper or nanostructured surfaces and so on, all of them are not going to give you mirror like reflection they are basically going to give you diffuse reflectance that means we are going to get the reflection of light in possibly all the directions and this is also known as the paper like reflection reflection so there are two kinds of reflectance that needs to be studied mostly it's diffuse reflectance if you are considering the general cases and any kind of practical sample uh, there is a very important law this term you might have come uh, uh, across before which is called the beer lambert's law and this is basically a linear law which talks about absorbance so, uh, if you want to know how much concentrated the sample is or how much dense the sample is, this law plays a very important role. So, if you use a spectrometer, you can actually use it to find out the concentration of the solution and for that we use the absorbance spectra that means how much of the signal is absorbed. So, if you look into the beer lambert's law, it basically states that this absorbance, this absorbance is uh, linearly proportional, so directly proportional to the concentration C. Okay and the path length of the light in the solution. So, if you have got this much amount of uh, sample and then light is passing through this, uh, then this will depend on what is the concentration of this particular solution and how much distance this incident radiation has to pass through. Uh, okay. So, that means this much is the sample, so this is called the path length. And then of course, since uh, absorption is proportional to the path length in C, there should be an involvement of a proportionality constant which is basically known as molar absorptivity okay, k. So, that means absorbance is equal to A into L okay, where A is uh, nothing but uh, k. Okay, so, A we can see from the equation I think it is become uh, simple A is equal to uh, k into C. So, if you consider the concentration and the constant and the constant proportionality constant which is called the molar absorbity we basically have something which we call as the absorption coefficient then there are also some reasons because of which this linearity which we saw that absorbance is directly proportional to length and concentration might vary and there the behavior might be non linear in nature this happens if the solution is highly concentrated. So, sometimes it does happen that some of the instrument is not able to work properly or give you an accurate result because the concentration is very high and the beer lambert law is not followed and it basically will present a deviation for the molar absorbity due to electrostatic interaction between the molecules in close proximity. So, if the concentration is more, the electrostatic interaction is more and then there are more losses okay, which cannot be uh, studied or identified by these instrument, it basically causes a large change in the index of refraction of the solution and changes in the chemical equilibrium. Now, the, uh, if the concentration is high, it is also possible that the particulates in the sample may cause light scattering reducing the transmittance, okay, so that is also possible. And then the samples that uh, basically have the property of fluorescence or phosphorence and stray light and or non monochromatic radiation reaching the detector, it will basically cause an error in the determination of the transmittance. So, if the samples are fluorescent or phosphorant in nature, they can again create some problem in studying the signal more accurately. So, that is all for today. Thank you.